So, in our first reading for today from the Hebrew Bible, when David offers to build a temple for God, does anybody else find God's response to be a little on the harsh side of things? <laughs> I mean, Robbie David's like, God, I'll build you a temple. It's like, great, awesome. Here is the pledge card for the building fund. Excellent. But no, no, no. Do not put God on your capital campaign committee, clearly. I mean, David is now enthroned king of all Israel. And he looks around at his palace of cedar and begins to consider the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence with the Israelites, a golden chest holding the original Ten Commandments that Moses received on the mountain, along with miraculous bread from heaven called manna the Israelites ate in the wilderness and other signs of God's providence. I mean, we heard how important this was last week, right? In the Hebrew Bible reading for last week, when David captured the ark back from the Philistines and was dancing in front of it as they carried it into Jerusalem. On top of the ark were two golden cherubim. Now, when I say cherubim, get rid of your ideas of cute little babies with little wings. Cherubim were fierce creatures in the ancient Near East. In ancient Near Eastern descriptions, cherubim were often lions with wings that were set down in the throne of an emperor or a king was placed on top of these cherubim. So on top of the ark are these two golden cherubim, wings outstretched, serving quite literally as the place upon which the throne, the presence of God, rests. So this most holy of objects, the symbol of where God dwells with his people, David realizes is still housed in the temporary tent the people had used throughout the wilderness wanderings. David dwells in a cedar palace while God's presence is still in an old tent. And so David decides he will build a permanent temple for the ark, a permanent and resplendent home for God's presence. Our reading doesn't include this detail, but after David decides this, he goes to the prophet Nathan, tells him what he wants to do, and Nathan says, great, awesome idea. Here's the pledge card. Just kidding. Great idea, David. Go for it. Build that temple. But then God appears to the prophet Nathan at night, clearly angry at what David has said. Are you the one, God asked, with just a little bit of sarcasm, are you the one who's going to build me a house? I don't need your house. Did I ever ask for a house? I'm the one who made you king. If I want a house, I'll make a house. I'm the housemaker in this relationship, God seems to say. You and I read God's declarations to David. We maybe wince a little and ask, what in the world ticked God off? It seems like David's idea was a noble one, build a temple for God. Why did God reject this? so strongly. At first glance, we might think that maybe the problem is the idea of the temple itself. Maybe this text is, is an indictment of spending lavish amounts of money on places of worship. Get rid of the buildings, right? Given our experience of church via Zoom and YouTube after the year, this might be a tempting idea to some people. There were many people who said at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, that now, look, we can see our buildings don't really matter. They don't matter at all. But that was the opposite of my experience. What I learned is they do matter. Oh, they matter so much. <laughs> These are the places where we feel God's presence. So much more so than in my pajamas with a cup of coffee in the living room. <laughs> right? These places matter. And of course, if we pay attention to the rest of the biblical text, we know the rest of the story. We know that a temple is built a beautiful, glorious temple. And it's pretty, pretty resplendent. It took lots of money, and God gave them the directions precisely how to do it. And the temple becomes a key focal point for the entire nation. So the temple, the temple cannot be the problem if we read the Bible carefully. The temple can't be the issue. If we pay close attention to the text, notice what God says in response to David's idea. God's problem is not with the idea of the temple. Rather, all of God's words concern the person of David and his relationship with God. That's clear even in the initial rhetorical question, are you going to build me a house? And then later, I took you from the pasture. I made you king. I've been with you wherever you went. I'm the one who gave you rest from your enemies. God's 
frustration seems to be based upon the, his relationship with David. It seems that David has lost a sense of how that relationship truly functions. And we see that at the very beginning of our reading for today, right? David didn't create the rest he's enjoying. The Lord gave him rest. David didn't settle in his house. In the Hebrew Bible reading, the Hebrew itself is very clear. David was settled in the house. Passive voice. Avoid it in any academic paper, but helpful in this text right here. David <laughs> was settled in the house. By whom? Well, this is why you shouldn't have used the passive voice. It's unhelpful. But we're assuming God, right? It would, if I had written it out, God settled David. It would have been, I can't fix it, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> so David, comfortable in his cedar palace, has perhaps begun to think, oh, look what I've done. Look at the rest I've made for myself in the country. Oh, maybe I should go ahead and build a temple for God, too. And if you notice, David's not asking God if he should build a temple. He's not inquiring after the Lord for the Lord's will about such an important question. He just assumes that his own desires should be realized. Unlike any of us, right, who never assume when we're talking or praying. who never assume that our own desires are what God should do. Right? David reasons, God needs a house like I need a house. I think the text is beginning to pick at David's motives a little bit, maybe beginning to needle us a little too, hopefully. I mean, it's fair. People like David, like you and me, people need stability. We need a sense of rootedness, a sense of where exactly our home is. The nomadic existence is not for many. I think maybe part of the problem in this text is fear of instability. In David's mind, maybe in our own, God needs a temple, a house, so that God's location can be set. God needs a house so I can know where exactly God is whenever I need God. And so I can know where to avoid when I don't want to be bothered by God. It might appear at first glance that David is looking to protect and care for God, but in actuality, I think the only thing David is protecting is his own conception of what God should look like. His own forgetfulness about what God has done. By fooling himself into believing he can protect God, he winds up instead protecting his own conceptions of the way God can and should operate. Once again, not like us, right? How often do we think it's our job to protect God? To protect God. When we're really just protecting our own conceptions of God, which are probably a lot weaker than God himself. But our God... Oh, our God, our God doesn't need to be protected, and our God does not stay in one place. God cannot be nailed down and boxed in. You see, this is where the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark gets it wrong. You know that scene at the end of the movie when the Nazis have the Ark and then they open it up and this powerful force escapes them within the Ark, melts them into nothingness? I have no idea why anyone thought that's a good movie for kids to watch. Oh my goodness, I can't even, I mean... Oh, boy. It's, it's terrifying stuff, right? But contrary to what the movie assumes, God never dwelt within the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, God's presence rests above the Ark, resting on those cherubim, that cherubim throne. God's presence rests there, always ready to go out and move among God's people. That's what God says in this text. Since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, I've been moving about in a tent and tabernacle whenever I've moved about among all the people of Israel. God's not like us. He doesn't need a home, a rooted place. Because even when the temple is built later by David's son Solomon, God is very clear that the temple won't be a house for him to dwell in. That's the language God used when chastising David's preconceptions in our reading. Rather, God makes clear that when this temple, this house is built, it will be a house for his name, not his dwelling. God will still move about God's people. God will always move about God's people. And that's good news because when this text was actually edited together, when they took all of these old stories that they'd been telling themselves for hundreds of years and decided to put it in a book, it was after the exile, after the temple had been destroyed. So down the, down the road, hundreds of years after this story about David, 
after the temple is demolished, their nation destroyed, they tell themselves this story. They remind themselves that God never lived in that temple, that God is not constrained by that temple. They tell, them self, they tell themselves this story to remind themselves how God clarified that, to be honest, he always prefers the nomadic existence, moving among his people, wherever his people find themselves, even when they find themselves far, far from home. And so maybe when our houses, when our conceptions of God are destroyed, when our sense of place in the world is uprooted and demolished, whether it's through a loss of a job, the death of someone we love, or a relationship that we thought was strong, which is all of a sudden evaporated in front of us, or when our failures have become so immense that we want to hide ourselves in shame. I think mercy drips from the story because the story reminds us that God doesn't dwell in a fixed place. God doesn't dwell in that place which is slipping away from you. God didn't ever live there. God's always moving in and among God's people. And that means God is free. God is free to be moving among the Israelites even when they're lost in exile because they are not lost from God. That means God is free to move in and among you still persistently present with you, no matter how much other things in your life may crumble and shift and change. God is not like us, but God knows us. God knows God's people. God knows our fears. God knows how hard it is for us to live without a home, without a place where we are rooted. And so, in this text, with our own pain and our lack of stability made evident, God makes a promise. A promise that God's people will be rooted and planted. In verse 10, God says, I will appoint a place, a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they will live in their place and not be disturbed anymore. An evildoer shall afflict them no more as formerly. David, oh David, oh silly David, searching for a way to nail God down, a way to ensure stability. David, you think you'll build a house for God? No, God says, perhaps not with as much anger as we thought, but perhaps with a bit of love. No, David, I'm going to build a house for you. And what kind of a house does God build for David? It's lovely that word house has two meanings in English, right? House, building, and house, family, people, right? The house of Windsor for the monarch. In Hebrew, it's the same way. Bayit has two meanings, house building and house people. God's going to build a house that won't require a bunch of cedar, won't need a pledge card. God is building a house that requires one thing, and that's a people. God's taking David and, and our human impulse for a shrine and God is redeeming, transforming that initiative and in the, instead promising that he'll create a house that will provide stability for all people. What David, God's doing here is creating the Davidic dynasty, the dynasty that Christians believe finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the branch from David's tree. And throughout the Hebrew Bible on through the New Testament, even today, God is at work building a house, a people where God can dwell. And even we hear in the epistle reading for today from Ephesians, that that's what God was doing in Jesus in the first century, the division at that time being between Jew and Gentile. The reason the house God is building is so strong is because God is always taking people that couldn't imagine, them, imagine themselves in the same building with that other group. <laughs> and God is, God is bringing them together, one united people, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, Greek, Roman, one people, conservative, liberal, wealthy, poor, speaking English, los que hablan espanol, documented, undocumented, one people. This is the temple of God today.
the temple of God today is found in the communities we form as baptized Christians. And that house finds its fulfillment in the church across the world, finds its fulfillment in this very community when we're doing what we should be doing by being a place of welcome, a place of stability, safety, and justice for all human beings. The building matters, don't get me wrong, the building matters, but the building has no meaning without the people who are in this building. The reason the building matters is because of what you have given to the community that lives here. The way you as the people of God have turned this community into a temple, a sacred space a sanctuary for those who are fleeing injustice, who are fleeing a sense that they could never be loved. You are the ones who build this house, this house that God is building through your faithfulness. So in your life, no matter what instability you encounter, no matter what lack of home or rootedness you feel, no matter what disorientation that swirls around you, God's offering a place for you to be rooted in by you becoming the walls and ceilings of God's house. You'll find stability, God tells us, not by making a house of your own desires, but by joining with people very different than you and extending your hand in love, mercy, forgiveness, and the commitment to build a house where all people can find themselves finally at home. And that's where God dwells. Amen.